We're going to continue our journey through the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We're getting toward the end. I think it's about five sermons to go after uh, journeying through all that Jesus has taught in Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7. We're heading towards the end, but also as we head towards the end, we begin to sort of experience how Jesus is landing this sermon for us, grabbing all of these great themes that he's been ta- taking us through and how he sort of lands this great aeroplane called the Sermon on the Mount and uh, the points of application that he draws us towards. Today we're going to be looking at probably one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible and certainly one of the most famous instructions that are given to all who would follow Jesus. As we heard in the reading today, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and in the prophets. What's striking about Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, is it does actually represent the end point of two and a half chapters of his teaching. Up to this point, Jesus has been unpacking the lessons of what does the kingdom of God look like, and this verse, verse 12, is the end of that teaching. What we're going to be seeing as we move on from verse 12 to the end of the chapter is Jesus is beginning to challenge us to take what he has taught seriously and to think about how we can live it out. But this is the ending, ending of his teaching on the kingdom of God and the beginning of how do we live this out in the world around us. So this is a really key turning point. It summarizes all that has gone before and it sets up what is yet to come. And all this is covered in the famous golden rule, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is a really hard sermon to preach. Do you know why it's hard to preach? Because it's really obvious like, do to others what you would like them to do to you. Yeah, do that. End of sermon. Right? There's no mystery. There's no weird linguistic thing. There's no, you know, historical context I can bring in that's, that suddenly makes it mean something completely different or brings it to life. It literally is, how do you like to be treated? Okay? Do that to other people. How do you like to be spoken to? Okay? Do that to other people. How is it that you like people to react to you when you're having a bad day? Okay? do that to other people. I mean, it is, really is as simple as that. The problem with, the, with this particular verse, and the, guess the reason why I get to actually preach a sermon on it rather than just finish it about right now, is because what it says is so, so obvious that I don't need to explain it to you. You all immediately get exactly what's being said here. The challenge is not in understanding what Jesus says, The challenge is for us to become the kind of people who can actually live this out each and every day of our life. We know what it says, but can we live what it says? And what is it that stops us from being able to live what it says? I think the greatest challenge in the golden rule is not that we, is not in understanding what it says. The greatest challenge that the golden rule represents to us is it challenges us to be radically honest with ourselves. Do you know, it's not uncommon for me to have conversations with someone where they come to me and this person is bringing um, quite harsh, direct criticism against sometimes me, but often against other people. You know, Steve, you know, this person's not good enough or this person's failing or this person, you know, really should do better or, you know, this, and they bring really direct and strong criticism or critique about another person. And sometimes in those conversations, I have the opportunity to pull them up a little bit. And I say, well, you know, like I hear what you're saying and I appreciate what you're saying, but how would you feel if someone else spoke, to, spoke about you in the way that you're speaking about that person? How would you feel if someone was treating you or speaking about you the way that you're speaking about the other person? And in that moment, they always give me the same answer. Nobody ever says, oh, sorry, Steve, you're, you're, you're so right. Actually, no, I think I have crossed the line there. Let me pull myself back and let me approach this topic in a way that I would actually like it to be approached if I was the target. No one has ever pulled themselves up at that point. Whenever I challenge someone to follow the golden rule, nobody corrects themselves. What do they do? What they do is they say, no, no, Steve, you don't understand. I'm just being honest. I'm just speaking the truth. And I would want someone to be honest to me if I was ever in that situation, to which I go, rubbish rubbish. You're completely deluding yourself. Often the people who are the most vocal in their critiques of other people, the moment you turn around and give them the exact kind of criticism or critique that they've just offered to someone else, 
Do they just accept it graciously? Well, you know what? I gave it out. I've got to take it back. That's just the way the life works. It's the golden rule. Do they ever take it graciously or do they all of a sudden become super defensive, super angry, super annoyed, super upset, and have just revealed that the way that they treat other people is not even within the ballpark of how they actually want to be treated themselves, no matter what delusional state they put themselves in. I'm just being honest is not a defense, it's a deception. It's self-deception. I'm just telling the truth is not a defense. So often it's just a sign of poor character and poor self-awareness. I had this dream, by the way, you know, this pastor dream, because I, I hear that line a lot, I'm just telling the truth, I'm just being honest. Um, uh, I had this dream that one day s- s- someone's going to come up to me and they're gonna, with great energy and excitement. They say, Stephen, I've got something really important to say to you. And I say, oh, what is it? What's going on? I want to talk to you about so-and-so. I say, really? What's a, what, what, what is it that you want to say about so-and-so? Do you know that person is a wonderful person? They're just fantastic. They are so gifted in this way and gifted in that way. They are so, they've, they've been so wonderful, blessing to everyone. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling the truth. They are a wonderful person. Like, no one has ever done that to me. No one has ever come to be honest to me about how good someone else is. Whenever someone brings the quote-unquote honesty or plays the honesty card, it's always because they want to be, uh, want to be uh, somewhat uh, mean-spirited in the way that they overly critique another person, in a way that they want me to react or respond to that. The point is this. The challenge of the, great, of the, um, of the golden rule is not that it's hard to understand, but it calls from us an absolute radical level of self-awareness and honesty and integrity in the way that we position ourselves in the world. Do you really want to be spoken to like that? Do you really want people to speak about you in that way? Do you really want to be treated in that way? No self-deception, no momentary feeling of power because you, you know, here I am, I'm treating someone else the same way, and I'm sure I'll be fine if I got treated the same way too, but I'm really enjoying the moment of being, of, you know, no self-deception, pure, radical honesty. The golden rule is so important because our words and our actions do in fact shape the world that we live in. Our words and our actions do start a chain reaction. Have you ever noticed in social settings that so often people match your tone and match your body language? Have you ever noticed that if you walk in really aggressive, people immediately have a reaction of just becoming a little bit either defensive, like you can just see themselves closing themselves off, or they become sort of aggressive back. They're sort of ready for the fight. And all you've done is just walk, and you've, by the way you posture or position yourself in the world, you're automatically drawing a response or a reaction from the people around you. If you walk in very open and relaxed and calm, often the environment around you begins to calm down. As a matter of fact, one of the key tenets of leadership, for those of you who are leaders in the room, one of the the key tenets of leadership is, is in every way that you possibly can always be a calming influence in any room you walk into. So it's about holding yourself in that place of clarity and calmness so that no matter how worked up or how frantic other people feel around you, you become a calming presence in the middle of that space. And often, not always, that calming presence from a key leader in a room rubs off on other people and that actually allows the whole temperature of the room to calm down or people's anxiousness or anxiety to calm down somewhat. People mirror the attitudes and the actions of each other. Often we're going to find ourselves in a place where maybe other people are treating us poorly or maybe other people are not responding in a way which is healthy for people. And what Jesus is calling us with the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is he's calling for us to take the first step. And this can often be the hardest thing for us to do because we walk into a space and maybe the temperature is, is up. Maybe there's, you know, hard words being said back and forth. Maybe people are getting themselves a little bit worked up over whatever issue is that they're getting worked up. Maybe some unjust and unkind things are being said. And our instant response is we want to be defensive. We want to be argumentative. We want to give, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You insult me, I'm going to insult you. And I can do it twice as better as you can. So watch me come and do that. You know, all of those instincts rise up within us. And the the golden rule is Jesus saying to us, even in that moment, you be the one to take the initiative. You be the one to take the first step. And you put yourself in a frame that says, in this moment, and yes, even in this moment, I will do to others what I wish that they would do to me. I would hold myself in that place 
and hold myself accountable to that call. And this is where the golden rule really lands for us because this can feel so terribly unfair. If we are the person going around being kind and patient and generous and good to everyone else, because that's the way that we want to be treated, but no one else is being kind and patient and generous or good to us because they aren't following Jesus and they're caught up in their own agendas. That experience can feel incredibly unfair. And we can even say, Jesus is expecting too much from me. And we can be tempted to excuse ourselves and let ourselves treat others in a way that makes us feel strong and powerful instead of in a way that we would actually genuinely wish to be treated ourselves. And this is where the golden rule becomes a sacrifice for us and a challenge to us. If we are disciples of Jesus, then we follow Jesus and we take the first step. And sometimes that means that we even need to bear the burden of injustice and bear the burden of unfairness. But if we believe in Jesus, and if we believe that the Holy Spirit will take our, our offering of obedience, then we can be confident that God is even using that sacrifice to make us an instrument of seeing the glory of God come into the world around us. I do want to pick up how Jesus finishes this, because I think it's interesting how he finishes. So, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the golden rule. But then he says, for this sums up all the law and all the prophets. The law and the prophets. Basically, what he's saying is, so the law is the, the, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that lays down the expectations of God's expectations on his people in how they ought to live. And the prophets, if you will, are the sermons on the law. It's the commentary. It's kind of putting that into practical action. It's a kind of a shorthand way of people in Jesus' day saying the Bible, you know, the words of God, you know. And so what Jesus is saying is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This sums up the entire teaching of the Bible. If you wanted to get the entire Bible and collapse it down into one sentence, that, that's your sentence. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Every sermon, every instruction, and every teaching can be reduced to this one command. And then immediately, if you, know, um, if you know more of Jesus' teaching, that probably immediately brings this to your mind. This is uh, Jesus saying, answering the question, um, how is it that we, we must faithfully be worshippers of God, faithfully keep the law? Jesus says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. Which means if we unpack the teaching of Jesus in total... What Jesus is saying is this. Do you know that Bible, that great big thick book that most of us never quite get through, particularly the, the, the boring hard bits? You know that great big Bible? It's important to read it. It's got great stuff in it. Work your way through it. But actually, the whole book can be reduced to three short statements. And if you're reading the Bible and you're not getting these three short statements, then you're not reading it right because these are the framing statements that set up everything else. And what are they? Love God. Love your neighbor. And do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And as Jesus explicitly says about each of them, these fulfill all the law and all the prophets. All the law and all the prophets are summarized in love God, love your neighbor, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this simplifies our faith. And it gives us a baseline to work up from. Our reading of the Bible should see us growing in three areas. What are the three areas that our reading of the Bible should see us growing in? Love God, love your neighbor, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How do you read the Bible? Love God, love your neighbors, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? It's so simple. It's so clear. Yet it calls for such a radical level of honesty with ourselves but it also invites us through this one simple injunction to enter into the fullness of the life that God has for us as we love God, love our neighbours and do unto others as we would have people do to us. As you've been thinking about this golden rule, what are some ways that you can incorporate the, incorporate the golden rule into your daily routine? So I want you to think practically. This has all been a bit airy-fairy, abstracted stuff that I've been giving from the pulpit today. 
How does this hit you? What are some simple ways, don't overcomplicate it, what are some simple ways you can incorporate the golden rule into your daily routine? And then how can we be honest with others? Because there is a place for honesty and truth-telling, absolutely there is. How can we be honest with others while ensuring that our honesty doesn't hurt or diminish them? And how can you trust Jesus' wisdom and follow the golden rule when others take advantage of your kindness or misinterpret your intentions? I invite you to spend a few, few minutes together, about 10 minutes together, sharing. God, thank you. Thank you for your incredible grace. Thank you that you do not uh, load us down with just endless rules and endless laws and that you do not call us into a life of worrying about every single little tiny detail and considering whether that detail makes God happier with us or sad or at us. But thank you, Lord God, that you call us into relationship. That's the key. You call us into relationship with you. You call us into relationship with God the Father. You call us into relationship with the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and gives us your power and your, uh, your ability to be able to live the life that you're calling us to live. Thank you for your deep grace. Thank you for your deep love for us. And thank you, Lord God, that you, that you call us into relationship. Love God, love our neighbours, and in relationship with the world around us, do to others what you would have them do to you. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would carry this deep teaching, this deep truth out into the world around us. Pray that your gentle Holy Spirit would continue to provoke and prompt it in our hearts and that we would understand the incredible privilege we have of, be, of being those who can even set the atmosphere and the culture in the places you've called us into simply by the way we act, simply by the words we speak, simply by the way we react in a way that truly represents how it is that each of us would truly wish to be treated. Heavenly Father, give us the courage, give us the grace. And in those times in which it doesn't seem to be working, and those times do definitely happen, give us the stamina and the faith to continue to put you first, even above our own, our, our own needs and our own wants. Lord God, we commit all of these things into your hands in Jesus' name. And amen.